think we are ready to go. It is 7.01. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. My name is Christine Dauenhauer. I run the Career Connections Program. We are really, really fortunate to have Bill Bagley with us again tonight to talk about a topic that I think is going to hit home with um, no matter whether you're a student or alumni or um, professional of any kind, um, but the topic of managing yourself around time demands and time constraints. So we've got Lauren Cobble on the line also from our college advising department, and we have a number of our steering team students on the line. So certainly start thinking about your questions as we move through the materials, and we'll make sure that there is time for that at the end. I am going to put the registration link out just for anyone that's new this evening that does that we don't have your name and contact info info. We'd love to get it so we can send you the materials. So watch for that in the chat. And I will turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you, Christine. Good evening, everyone. Glad you're here. We're going to talk about the toughest challenge you're going to have. We talked about oral presentation being really difficult, and that's a psychological challenge that people have to get through. But this is a real area of concern with people and with organizations, and that's being able not to manage time but to manage yourself around time demands and time constraints. And there, I've been teaching it for years and I still struggle with it. So I think most people who are strive to be successful find themselves banging up against the clock all the time. And I will give you some ideas on how to help yourself manage around that, but I'm not convinced that anyone really totally develops an ability to manage themselves completely around the time that's in, in front of us. So what time is it? Now, when you think about time, the last thing you do when you go to bed at night, you look at the clock. How many hours do I have before I have to get up? And you wake up in the middle of the night and you strain to look at your clock to see what time it is. How many, how many hours do I have left before I have to get up? And then when you get up, you look at the clock and think, how much, how much time do I have to get ready to get to work and to, to get the kids ready and to check my email, my voicemail and Facebook and all the things I need to do before I hit the road. And then in your car, you're looking at the clock thinking, what if I run into a traffic jam and we've got a meeting at 7.30 and it's always there. During the day, you're always glancing at the clock to see how much time, what time will I get home tonight? When, when is our lunch meeting? What time's that meeting start? So the clock is always there. And Tony Alessandra, who's the author of The Platinum Rule, talks about time in this way. It, he feels it's nature's greatest force. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can alter it. Unlike the wind, it cannot be felt. Unlike the sun, it cannot be seen. Yet of all nature's forces, time has the most profound effect on us. And I think one of the problems when you're younger, you think, well, I've got all the time in the world. And the fact of the matter is the clock is ticking every second. And I, I don't want you to get to the point where you're paranoid about time moving so quickly, but all of a sudden you turn around and you're 30 and then you're 45 and then, and then it's you're 65 and it catches people by surprise when it's time for them to retire. And then they're like, you know, 15 years, I'll probably be dead. And so people start laying their lives out in that fashion. And what I'm trying to do tonight is to help you get the priorities first. What are the things you want to achieve? And then worry about time after that. It's, this is based on, this training is based on, I'm, I got to get rid of this thing, I'm sorry. Guess it won't go away. Okay, sorry about that.
It looks fine from our side, Bill. It was blocking my view. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Okay, the training is based on first things first, which is a concept that Stephen Covey promoted for a number of years, but actually Roger and Rebecca Merrill wrote the book. And then Covey, who is the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, folded their material into his training. And it's about putting first things first. So that's what this training is based on. The objectives of the training is to manage yourself around time, putting first things first, balancing these things, career and family, achieving personal and professional goals, getting things done, resolving conflicting priorities, and moving away from waste. Now, usually our first focus is on our career and family. Some people will put career first and other people will put family first, but those two are one and two in the scheme of most people's priorities. Secondly, you should be trying to achieve personal and professional goals. But because of so many demands placed on you and constraints that are out there, this one that is so important drops down to the bottom. Now, most of us won't have to worry about waste because when you get into a business environment, they manage that for you. There, are, there isn't much time to waste. So that one usually moves away on its own. But achieving personal professional goals instead of being second will fall below resolving conflicting priorities. So we'll be balancing career and family, getting things done, resolving co conflicting priorities, and then we'll start to focus on ourselves. And that's what we want to talk about tonight to get that back up to where it belongs. What comes to mind when I say time management? How do you feel? How are you impacted psychologically, emotionally, and physically? What do you immediately think of? And this is a question that I've asked thousands of people over the years in training them. And these are the things that are frequently expressed and concerns that people have. First of all, I need more time. Okay, well, that's not gonna happen. This is a constant mathematical formula it's 24 hours a day and that will never change. I want to enjoy my life more, I'm always running. I never have time for myself. My friends and family want more of my time. How do I give it to them? I feel I am always in a crisis mode. And some people like the feeling they get when they're in a crisis mode. Many people will tell me, I do my best work when I'm in a crisis mode. The problem is when you're younger, that doesn't really impact you. But as you get older, crisis mode, it may not affect you psychologically, but your body feels it. And this is where stomach issues, heart issues, stress, those high blood pressure, those things begin to mount as you get older. I procrastinate because I always feel under pressure and cannot decide which is the most critical crisis. One person told me one time that they had a, an extremely important project to work on and they had 15 hours to get it done and they rearranged their entire office. All the files, they changed their furniture around because they felt so much pressure about doing the pr project that they felt like I've got to do something else to get myself under control. Too much stress. And if you feel like you have stress today in school and then college will, it'll jump exponentially. And then when you get into business or not just business, but in any career field, when you're into a professional area, the stress is out of your control. You, ha you have so many masters that you, it's, you have to make a conscious effort to really manage the stress. There's much to do and it all seems important. I have no balance in my life. I always seem to be doing things for others and cheating myself. Okay, the question is, can you really manage time? If you are given two days to complete a project, can you manage that time? No, 
you cannot manage time. The term time management is an oxymoron of sorts. Humans are not able to manage time. They can only manage themselves around the time that's given them. If I give you two hours to complete a project, no matter what you do, the deadline is still going to be two hours. The key is to manage yourself around the demands and the constraints that are out there. <clears throat> are you leading your life or being led by life? Do you have balance in your life? How do you see time and what constitutes time crunch for you? So time crunch examples, think about that for a minute. What are some time crunch examples that you run into during the course of a week? Frequently expressed time crunch examples would be telephone. So if you're in your office or if you're in your room and you're working on homework assignment or on a special project and your phone goes off, you're going to ignore it? No. You're probably going to look at it anyway to see who it is, but it has distracted you from the most important thing that you're doing. Lack of necessary supplies and resources. You're working on a project. I need file folders. I need tape. I need staplers. I need highlighters. Email messages voicemail messages. There's a need to work out. Christine was just talking about when she worked at Price Waterhouse that they had a need to work. I mean, it's one way you manage stress is to work out. But her supervisor said, you need to cut that out. No, we, we got to focus on our work. Even though you're coming back and working late at night to make up for the time that you took off for the workout, no. Because the optics of you leaving with your workout bag to go to the gym is wrong. Now things have gotten better. This was not necessarily in the old days, but a few years back, things were much more military than they are now. There's more flexibility and the pandemic has had some favorable outcomes because people have learned that, you know, we can work virtually and get through things. <clears throat> but there was a time when FaceTime was all about FaceTime. During busy season in a public accounting firm, seven days a week. Partners are there on Sunday, you're there on Sunday, whether you have work to do or not. Some of those things have eased up. So at least our society is getting better from that perspective. But there's still a number of organizations where you're working, where those things are going to be pushed away from you. Then there are family needs and demands. Unscheduled interruptions. When I was at Deloitte, we had our door and right next to the door, there were a series of real small windows. So the rule in the office was, if the door is closed completely, do not interrupt. If it's open just a little bit and it's really urgent, then knock on the door and come in. Well, I would, there were times when I had to work on a special project and I'd have the door closed and locked and I'd have a conference sign out by my name in conference. And people would stand next to the door and look through that window until they got my attention. And I'd look up and they'd say, hey, I only need five minutes, just five minutes. So they come in, they spend five minutes, but what are they doing? They're interrupting you from your train of thought and from working on a best practice or a good idea or to solve a problem to drop something on you it's probably, it only took them five minutes to tell you about it, but it's likely an hour or two hour project that you've got to work with. Meeting overruns. Okay, meetings sometimes are a bad idea anyway. There are a lot of meetings that take place that should never have taken place. But then you get into a meeting and the tendency is it's an hour meeting. All of a sudden it goes an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes. So you have to stay until seven o'clock at night to make up for that lost half hour, 45 minutes, car troubles, battery, tires, transmission, picking up the laundry, going to the dentist, hair appointment, last minute request to attend a meeting. I mean, I, I remember agonizing over whether or not to go to the dentist to get an, an, an urgent dental issue taken care of because I was like, it's going to take three or four hours of my time and I really need to dedicate it to my work. And then training, 
Now I put training last because I'm a trainer. So I spend a lot of time doing training and I do feel it is important. But the fact of the matter is training takes away from your agenda. Okay, when we look at a clock, that's a symbol for efficiency. And it says these things, get as much done as possible. Productivity runs the business. Personal productivity drives compensation. When you work in a pro professional service firm, you're gonna get paid based on the number of charge hours that you push. And that determines to a certain degree how much you'll get paid. So people are like, okay, you know, I gotta work thousand hours of overtime this year in order to make the money I wanna make. <clears throat> if you do well on a budget, if you have a project and you improve the budget from last year, your reward is that the budget for the, the following year then is going to be 10% less. So the expectation has been tightened. Most technical inventions are focused on bringing about efficiencies so we all can have more leisure time. That was, that was the thrust behind all these technical inventions are, oh, now we'll have more time to do some other things that we wanna do. The reality, it adds to our personal loads. Cell phones, laptops with instant messaging, voice messaging, emails, texting. And I remember a number of years ago, I was on a conference call, which we shouldn't have even had the conference call because my boss called me from Chicago and said, hey, Bill, we need to have our monthly two hour conference call with all the regional HR leaders. Do you have any agenda items? And I said, well, the call's tomorrow, right? And he said, yeah. And he said, we don't have any agenda items. And I said, well, I got a good idea. Why don't we just not have the call? I mean, everybody's busy. We can use that two hours to do the work that's in front of us. No, we really need to have this conference call because it's an expectation every month. We're gonna get everybody together and trade ideas. I said, okay, well, I don't have any agenda items to offer you. So, well, we'll go ahead and have the call and then we can just talk about things in general. So we had the call. While I'm on the conference call, I thought, well, I'm just gonna mute my phone and then I'll work on email messages. I've got to get through 150 email messages. So I'll listen to the conference call, but I'll be working on my emails. And while I'm working on my emails, I get an instant message across the bottom of my screen saying, hey, Bill, I know you're on this conference call. Call me on your cell phone. So I got a conference call going. I'm doing email messages on my laptop. I get an instant message and then I'm calling somebody on my cell phone. Is that what, what drives people crazy? Okay, we're talking about a clock and a compass. So a clock provides, it represents our commitments, appointments, schedules, and activities, what we do with and how we manage our time. So the thrust of the clock is, it always puts a sense of urgency on what's in front of us. Compass represents our vision, values, principles, mission, conscience, and direction. What we feel is important and how we lead our lives. So the focus of this training is to let's get the direction out there first. Let's, let's crystallize our vision, our values, our principles, our mission, and what direction we want to be moving in, our priorities, and get those set. Then around that, we will set our commitments, our appointments, our schedules, and our activities. So those things aren't really urgency kinds of things. There are things that we have put into our schedule with intention. Okay, learning to manage by a compass turns our relationships as more important than our schedules. And effectiveness versus efficiencies. And it requires discipline because it's different from our training, our mindset, and our culture. Our culture is all about time management. And there is no such thing. It's managing ourselves around time. To live, to love, to learn, and to leave a legacy. This is the basis for changing your habits from being schedule driven to more around relationships efficiencies to effectiveness. Transactional 
to transformational. So transactional is tac tactical stuff where you're just driving something because project was given to you. And so you follow these procedures in order to get it done. Transformational is more about, let's find a better, different way of doing this. Let's find a more meaningful way to solve this problem. Let's do a best practice. And then urgency addiction, where you work like crazy all day long, you're out of breath at seven or eight o'clock at night to go home and fall asleep in a chair instead of spending time with your family to really mapping out a meaningful progress towards an end. Okay, let's talk about urgency addiction. We can talk about what it is and whether or not anyone has it. And I'm the first one to raise my hand. And I liked having it for years. I, I enjoyed having urgency addiction. It made me feel like I was needed, I was valuable, and I, that there was a sense of power around that. And then we'll look at what are some causes and symptoms. And this is the reality of that the clock is ticking. We don't really ever hear or see the clock, notice the second hand moving unless you have urgency addiction. And then you're constantly watching that because you're trying to, trying to beat the clock. Okay, here, here's an urgency quiz. Answer these to yourself, honestly. I do my best work under pressure. Yes, I do. I often blame external pressures for my failure to spend quality time with myself and family. I did for years. I get frustrated when people are slow to respond. I hate to stand in line or traffic. I'd send a message to somebody if they didn't respond within the hour I was calling them. That's not fair to them, right? I mean, people have other things going on too, but I needed to get it done. I feel guilty when I miss work. There were many years where I didn't miss any work. I always seemed to be rushing between places and events, and I was okay with that. I seemed to push people away in order to complete a project. I didn't do that one because I was in HR and that was against my nature. But I saw a lot of people around me doing that, pushing people away in order to get the project done. When is a project more important than a person? Never. But when you're driven by efficiency instead of effectiveness, then that becomes the rule. I'm often preoccupied with another thing when I'm doing something else. I'm at my best in a crisis mode. I get a kind of adrenaline rush when dealing with a crisis situation, absolutely. I remember working on things in my office after hours, late at night, dark out, looking out over the city of Cincinnati, beautiful scene and breaking out into a sweat because of the adrenaline rush of me pushing myself beyond where I should have been. But the, this adrenaline rush, especially when you're younger, seems more satisfying to me than dealing with the steady accomplishment of long-term goals. I often sacrifice quality time with people important in my life in order to handle a crisis. My wife and I had planned a vacation uh, all winter long. It was like this, like it is today. We were go going to uh, Savannah, Georgia and then to Jekyll Island. We were looking forward to it. And so when March rolled around, I said, we're ready to go, let's pack up and we'll take off. I got a call from my boss in Chicago. He said, we've got a crisis that we're gonna to have to deal with. It's firm wide and you need to be on this conference call. He said, I know you, you have a vacation plan for a couple of weeks, but this is a priority. I said, that's no problem. You know, we'll, we'll push the vacation off a little bit and I'll be on the call. So the, the day of the call rolled around, he called me and said, it's off. You go ahead and take your vacation. We're going to do this in a couple of weeks, so don't worry about it. So we went down to Savannah, got a nice room. My cell phone rings. Hey, the call's back on. So for two days, while my wife was sitting outside in the courtyard around the pool, I was on a conference call. And that's, that is exactly the things that you can't be doing. And that's, that's urgency over doing the priority things. 
I assume people will understand when I have to disappoint them in order to handle crisis. I just assumed my wife understands this. She probably didn't. She was good about it. But down deep, it's like, no, this is not right. I often eat lunch or other meals while I work. You know, there were many years where I would have somebody run out and bring a sandwich back so I could work because I want to be able to get home at seven or eight o'clock at night. Accomplishing tasks makes me feel effective. I keep thinking someday I will reach a point when I can do what I really want to do. And that day when you're under urgency addiction, that day never comes. Okay, urgent versus important. And this is, this is a differentiation that we need to make here. Ask yourself the following, and this is key. What is the one activity that you know if you did superbly well and consistently would have significant positive results in your personal life? Just one thing. What is the one activity that you know if you did superbly well and consistently would have significant positive results in your professional life? And then ask yourself, are you doing these activities now? If not, why not? And I, when I was confronted with this several years ago, I looked at the answers and I said, I am not doing these activities now because I'm too busy. I was spending too much time in my business as opposed to on my business. And so that was, that was the transformative time for me to say, I need to get, I need to get a grip on myself here. I need to get control over where I'm headed. Defining addiction, no matter the drug of choice, it creates predictable, reliable sensations. Becomes the primary focus of attention, temporarily eradicates pain and other negative sensations, provides artificial sense of self-worth, power, control, security, intimacy, and accomplishment, exacerbates the problems and feelings it has sought to remedy, it worsens functioning and creates loss of relationships. And this is workaholic. And this is becoming so obsessed with being successful in your work that it does create predictable and reliable sensations. So you feel a sense of power and self-worth when you're really over the top with your work and you're driving other people the same direction. And it does become the primary focus of attention. This is when, this is when career starts to overtake family. Then people are on the road all the time. And then when they're at home, they're either asleep because they're so tired or they're working on the project that will take them back on the road again. Does it temporarily eradicate pain and other negative sensations? Yeah. If you feel bad in the morning, you have a headache or feel like you're coming down with a cold or flu and you go to work, you don't feel the discomfort when you're working. And it does provide that artificial sense of self-worth, power, control, security, intimacy, and accomplishment. And you feel like you're always in those grooves there until you retire and then you realize people, nobody misses me. There's somebody else doing this for me. And it does exacerbate the problems and feelings that is sought to remedy. And all of a sudden you're a person people don't wanna work with and you begin to find that your family has moved a different direction. Urgency addiction is a self-destructive behavior that temporarily fills the void created by unmet needs. And instead of meeting these needs, the tools and approaches of time management often feed the addiction. They keep us focused on daily prioritization of not the important, but of the urgent. Essentialism is the direct opposite. This is the disciplined pursuit of less. And the author of the book is Greg McCowan, and he talks about quit celebrating how busy you are. And Facebook and other social media outlets really take this to another level because everybody's taking pictures of themselves and talking about this is what I'm doing and this, no one really cares. We overvalue and overplay the notion of doing it all, having it all, achieving it all. Jim Collins, the author of Good to Great, calls this the undisciplined pursuit 
of more. What enables this? An unholy alliance between smartphones, social media, and extreme consumerism. Marketers understand that people are out there showing all these things. So they're like, okay, we're gonna take advantage of this. The result is information and opinion overload. We know what everyone else is doing and assume we should be doing it too. No sense of priority or this is important versus urgent. It's just, this is what I need to do. I need to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. Consequences, you become an unhealthy definition of super person, someone who gets it all done. It leads to backdoor bragging. I'm so busy implying important and successful, and who really cares? We become addicted to the drug of busyness and we become pushers. Our children then are impacted by helicopter parents who are telling their children, you need to be involved in everything. When I was a kid, and I know that was 100 years ago, I played football, basketball, and baseball. My dad came to two games that I remember. It's like, hey, why are you, do why are you doing all these sports? You should be focused on other things that are more important. Now parents are taking their kids everywhere to make sure they're involved in everything. And it may not be that healthy. Proteges, you begin, you be, Again, giving them unnecessary tasks and asking them to work unnecessary hours. I did that with the person who partnered with me at Deloitte. Every year she worked thousand hours of overtime to try to keep up with what we were doing. Was that fair to her? No. It's just the way we were trained. So we did it and we got credit for it because we were very productive. But in the end, you're out of breath and you're wondering, is this really where we're headed? We outsource and invent in order to free us up to do more things. Antidote for this is the disciplined pursuit of less but better, effective as opposed to efficient. Disciples of this train of thought are essentialists. The essentialists subscribe to we're going to talk about this in a minute. Quadrant two actions. Quadrant two actions are all around, and this is a this is a Covey concept. Quadrant two is personal development and goals, preparing for the future, true recreation. And when you think about recreation, you look at the term recreation, we think of playing, recess, sports. But the real value of recreation is when you Look at the word recreation. You take time off to go to the gym, to take walks, to be with your family, to recreate yourself and give your creative powers an opportunity to, to regenerate. Free up weekends, take walks to think and ponder. I mean, we have a wonderful tool in our brain. We never give it a chance to work because we're always killing it. We're taxing it instead of taking time to really think through and try to solve issues and, and achieve goals. Insert technology-free times or zones in their homes and workplaces. Call friends versus Facebooking them. Take people to lunch instead of sending them emails. Trade impersonal conference calls for quality real time. To get started, it's recommended that you design a simple action list. Before you leave the office or school today, write down your top six priorities for tomorrow on a post-it note. Then cross off the bottom five. Write down your top priority on a post-it note and put it on your computer. Schedule a 90-minute window to work on your top priority, preferably the first thing of the day. Every time you are about to check email, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, and I know there are new apps out there, push past the tendency to be distracted from your number one priority. Okay, we talked about quadrant two. This is Covey's time management matrix. And you, you see at the top, urgent, not urgent. On the left-hand side, not important, important. Okay, crises are important and urgent. If we're in a building and I'm making a presentation and there's a bomb threat 
it doesn't matter what I'm talking about. It's important and urgent for us to get out of that building. I had open heart surgery two years ago. Okay, everything up to that point was like, yeah, I'm working out, doing, staying busy, et cetera. When I called my cardiologist and said, I'm having severe heart pain, he's like, you gotta have open heart surgery. We didn't say, well, wait a minute, I gotta work on this project. I got another hour or two. We went to the hospital and had heart surgery. Deadline driven project. Somebody gives you a critical project saying, we got to have this ready by eight o'clock tomorrow morning for a meeting. You work all night long. You got to get it done. It's important and urgent. Nothing trumps that. Then you get into quadrant two. These are extremely important things, but they're not urgent. Preparation for the, it's all about your quality of life, preparation for the future, prevention of illness and issues, working out taking care of yourself, eating the right foods, values clarification. Are you matched up in the right job with your own values? Are you planning for success? What does your plan look like? What type of relationship building? We talked the other week, last week about networking. That takes time. Are you building your network? Well, I've got 200 people. No, you need a thousand. You need to work on that. Important, but it's not urgent. You have to, don't have to do it tomorrow or next month, but you eventually have to do it. True recreation and then empowerment of yourself and others around you. Okay, that's the most important place to spend your time in quadrant two. When quadrant one comes up, you'll do that. You've got no choice. But then quadrant three appears and it's urgent, not important. It's called deception quadrant. And here we get back to the interruptions, some phone calls, some mail, some reports, some meetings, many proximate pressing matters, many popular activities, drop-in visitors, things that we feel are, are really urgent and they're not. We need to stop doing those things and focus on quadrant two. And then quadrant four is trivia, busy work, some phone calls, time wasters. You'll find that in time when you're in, in your career, those things will go away. These are escape activities. And as you mature professionally, they go away. Okay, when you look at high performance individuals and organizations, where do they spend their time? It's the green large font 65 to 8% of them spend their time in quadrant two. And this is where you need to find yourself. Okay, so how do we do this? We'll get to that in just a minute, but I wanna take a look at weekly time allotted to each of us. Okay, 168 hours in a week. There are 50 work hours. <clears throat> Most jobs, except when you're in a crunch or busy season, 10 hours a day. They say 40, but you can count on 50. 10 hours getting ready and driving to work. Now, the pandemic has pushed the virtual piece of this, so some of this may go away. But if we get back to what was the normal, that's 10 hours of getting ready and driving to work. This is in a week, two hours every day. Driving home, time spent sleeping, and you can't cut corners there because it begins to take a toll on your health. Preparing, eating meals. People don't account for these things. So, well, that's just a normal course. It takes time. House-related chores, then family-focused time, whether you're going to ball games, plays, helping your children with homework, recreation, 20 hours a week. So that leaves you every week if you, this is a full schedule, if you do all these things, six discretionary hours that can be spent on your personal and professional development each week. What do the vast majority of Americans do with these three discretionary hours? Virtually nothing at all. Mindless TV programs, one of thousands of sporting events on TV, repetitive news, incessant and inane talk shows, napping, or how about this? Dreaming about doing something worthwhile. 
here's an answer to that. How about doing something worthwhile instead of dreaming about it? Okay, so how do we get to the point of mapping out where you need to be of living in quadrant two? It's begin, you begin to focus on importance. Spending more time in quadrant two will lead to a more balanced way of life and all the other things that you need to get done, you'll get them done, but you'll do it in a more quality, qualitative way. Okay, the process of putting first things first is step one. You need to connect with your vision and mission. What is most important to you? What gives your life meaning? What do you want to be in to do in your life? Most people find this stuff out when they're getting ready to retire. It's too late. Identify your roles. What responsibilities and relationships do we have with our families, our job and community? Got a bunch of them. Step three, select quadrant two goals in each role. What's the most important thing I could do in each role this week to have the greatest positive impact? Now, most people at this point are saying, okay, this is too much work to do to assign all this to these steps. I'm just gonna let it happen. So 95% of the people just let it happen. And then the 5% or fewer are the ones that self-actualize because they mapped out their career destination. Step four, create decision-making framework for the week. The key, however, is not to prioritize your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Know what your priorities are first and schedule them and then work around that. Step five, exercise integrity in the moment. Commit to your quadrant two schedule, even when you are tempted to get off track. And sometimes it requires that you say no to somebody. Maybe your boss comes in and says, hey, I need this project. You know, I really would wanna do it, but my schedule is packed. Okay, I'll find somebody else to work on it. And then step six is to evaluate what you're doing. Review your schedule regularly and maintain quadrant two activities as the foundation of the way you live your life. Okay, so connecting to your mission, you develop your mission statement, your vision, your blueprint for living. What do I value most? What principles are at work? What can I contribute when I retire? Will I have regrets? And somebody once told me, you don't want to get to a point when you reti retire where you say, man, I wish I had it all to do over again. I would do it differently. Because as far as we know, we don't have a chance to do it all over again. So you got to do it now. And how do I wish to be remembered? The question is, if you were to pause and think seriously about the first things in your life, what are the three or four things that matter most? What would they be? Family, money, health, religion, career. Everybody's different. Those will be reordered for every person. Are these things receiving the care, emphasis, and time you really want to give them? And a lot of people would say no. But I'm going to fix that. Someday, I'm going to fix that. And they say that every decade and then they run out of time. So your, your personal mission statement would be this. Then you begin to review your roles. What are the hats you wear? Okay, there's a lot to do with taking care of yourself. And then you're an associate. You may be a leader of a group or an organization. You could be a parent, a spouse, a child. At some point, you'll be all these, sibling, friend, confidant, mentor, community, volunteer, more, there'd be more things out there. So these are all the things you're doing. And, and with each one of these, there's a time element connected to it. And you have to be aware of that because you don't want to cheat your spouse or your parents. I mean, both my parents are gone. I wish I had a chance to visit them again, call them again, send a letter to them and tell them how much I appreciate and love them. It's gone. I don't have the opportunity to do that again. Personal and professional roles in life. 
Identify your goals. If you were to do one, two, three things this week, it would have an impact on your personal role or life or your professional role, what would they be? List them. Again, it's people, don't, human beings don't have a problem achieving their goals. The problem is with establishing their goals. They never take the time to do that. They just say, oh, well, it'll all work out. No, it won't. You have to intentionally put down, these are the three things that I want to achieve. And every day I'm gonna look at that and I'm gonna say, what am I doing to get there? And if you do that, you'll achieve the goal. If you don't do that, chances are you won't. Organize weekly. Weekly organization is the key. Establish your plan for moving forward, the career destination in your work, your career, your life, not daily, but weekly. Between Friday and Monday morning, designate a quiet and private place for this to occur. Set as, I used to set aside Friday night. People usually would leave work right at five or around 5.30 or six. It got quiet. I turned the light off in my office, closed my door and I'd sit there for half an hour or 45 minutes and think about what is one thing that I really wanted to accomplish this week that I wasn't able to, to get to and then fix it. Okay, exercise in integrity. In the moment of choice, something interferes with your planned schedule, will you answer yes or no? The vast majority of people who are self-motivated will always say, yes, I'll do this. Yes, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it, I'll get it. At some point you have to say no. To be fair to me, I can't do this. So do you have the discipline to stick with this plan? Now, obviously, there'll be times when somebody will ask you or tell you to do something. You can't say no. But there are a number of times where you have a decision to make. Times when it might be difficult to stay true to your mission, roles, goals, write them down. How are you going to address these situations? And then at the end, evaluation. Choose wisely how you spend your time. As far as we know, we only get one chance at this life. So evaluate how you're doing at the end of each week. You're worth doing this evaluation. It's all about how you're leading your life. And these are some evaluation thoughts. What goals did I accomplish? What were some pleasant surprises that came about due to my organization and focus? What did I learn from the week? Am I staying within quadrant two? Am I moving in the right direction? How can I resolve conflicts without sacrificing my mission. The cost of the ind independent paradigm, and that's just letting things happen, is we begin to rush to live, rush to love, rush to learn, and we rush to leave a token legacy. You push people away from you because you're always rushing. And I can't tell you the number of conversations that I had with partners and managers, the firm I worked at, to tell them you're pushing people too hard. You need to back off and work with people. And they appreciated knowing that they needed to change that for themselves and for others. And the last thought here is Shakespeare's, I wasted time, now doth time waste me. And this is where too many people end up. They feel like they've got all the time in the world and so they waste a lot of it. And then it's time's turn and you're at a point where you can't really do much to salvage who you are and where you're headed. And so time begins to waste you. Any questions? That, that was fantastic, Bill. Um, well, Thank you. well while, while folks are on the line, I'd love to ask you a question, Bill, because it's been something certainly I've struggled with at points in my career. Any advice on how to set boundaries and stick to those boundaries in the face of, you know, the challenging work environments? Give me an idea of when you talk about boundary, you mean as far as setting parameters around how available you are? 
Yeah, I mean, I think when you were hitting on the cell phone and, you know, we're all carrying around laptops and isn't this wonderful that we can work from anywhere, the yeah. the devil in the details is now you can work from anywhere at any minute of the day. Yeah. So I it introduced this difficulty on how do you set those boundaries and communicate those boundaries when your direct line management is expecting something different. And that's <laughs> where it gets tricky. <laughs> yeah. That's the challenge. You know, I'm it's easier for me now because I'm my own boss and uh, I tell people, clients or prospective clients that my time in the morning until 11 o'clock is I don't do anything. I don't do, I don't do presentations. Now I might do a phone call or a zoom call, no meetings, no, I don't do any training because I need that time in the morning to, for me, whether it's the workout or to get myself organized. Now I work till midnight. I don't mind that part of it, but the one boundary that I've set for myself, and I did, even did this at Deloitte. I mean, everybody came in with crack and dawn at Deloitte. I mean, they want to get in there early in the morning and get started. And I came in at 8.30 or 9, and I told the partners, I said, now, if you have a real problem with this, I'm not here to dictate what I'm doing, but I want that time in the morning to work out, uh, to do whatever I need, need to do to get organized for the day. And they, and they were like, that's fine. As long as you get the work done, we don't care. And I think most organizations now, especially, are saying, just get the work done. I don't care when you do it. So that's where I set my boundaries. Now I'm flexible from 11 until midnight. I mean, I'll go to meetings, do training, development, everything. But from the time I get up in the morning till 11 o'clock, that's my time. That sounds selfish, yeah. but it allows me to, to get organized and know what I'm doing so I can go forward the rest of the day and be effective. Yep. Does that help? That's great. Yeah, let, <laughs> let, me, let me open it up to others. I don't see anything in the chat window, but folks should feel free to use the chat window or come off mute. Happy to let do Let me ask everybody else this question. Anybody out there feel like they have control over this? And there are an exceptional few people who would say, I actually do, I've figured this out. And my hat's off to anybody who has figured it out because just like you said, Christine, you have a lot of masters and they're coming to you saying, I need this, I need this, I need to talk to you, I need, we need a meeting, whatever. But people will run over you if you don't set the boundary and say, okay, I'm happy to meet with you. How about we meet at 11 o'clock at night instead of 7 o'clock in the morning? Now, I don't mean to be flip about it, but they usually take that in good humor and say, okay, let's, I, I got it. Let's, let's meet at 6 or whatever. Yep. Will, Will Sicking just put in a question. I'll read it to you. Would you recommend taking sick days if you have them? That's it. You know, do you drag yourself in with the flu because you're the warrior? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I would say if you're truly ill, you should stay home for a couple of reasons. I mean, for yourself, but also you don't want to bring it into everyone else. I think we've all learned from this virus that people do need to be a little bit more vigilant around taking care of themselves and others. But I will tell you, there, there was a time when I went to work sick because I felt I needed to be there. And I mean, that's foolhardy because once you retire, you realize people miss you for an instant. And then it's like, they just keep going. I remember when President Kennedy was assassinated, I was a senior in high school and I was like, the world surely will stop. How are we gonna live without President Kennedy that didn't miss a beat, just kept going. And I mean, I think that's what you have to feel like if you're ill, you need to stay home and get better because somebody will find a way to take your work. But I think if the, if the question is, I'm given benefits and the benefits, for instance, 
when I was at Deloitte, I had six weeks of vacation. Well, that's kind of a false benefit because there's no way that I'm going to take six weeks of vacation because the work has to get done. So you'll find, you'll have to find a way to get the work done. You may take the six weeks off, but you're going to work another six weeks on top of that in order to, to get that time off. So I would say when somebody says you get six weeks of vacation and 10 sick days, just because I have them, will I take them? No. The most important thing to me was to get, make sure that I was doing my job effectively and spending quality time with my family. And I was able to balance that by taking two or three weeks of vacation. It's okay. But everybody's different on that. And I know it's more demanding out there to get more free time. And that's just foreign to me, old school. Sorry. <laughs> There's one more question, Bill, that came in from John. How do you develop the mindset to continue to look at a job as an opportunity instead of a repetitive drag? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I, I will tell you that too many people look at it the second way. And the, there's a there's a great story out there. And I won't, I'll do you all a favor and not tell you the whole story, but it's called Acres of Diamonds. And the short version of it is, and it's a true story about a, a farmer in South Africa. And this was years ago. And the person who started Temple University gave this sermon to raise money uh, to build Temple University. His name escapes me right now, but he was a, a, a reverend, a man of the cloth. And the story of Acres of Diamonds was this farmer looked at his job as farming as being uh, a drag. I can't get up every morning and tilling my soil and trying to grow crops, et cetera. I hear that there are, there are diamond miners out here finding in these streams in South Africa, all these diamonds. So I'm gonna sell my farm and I'm going to go look for diamonds. So he sold his farm to a man who really took farming seriously. And he worked it. And while he was tilling the soil, he uncovered the largest diamond ever found at that time. And it was worth millions of dollars. And he took that and developed his farm into an empire. For the, the farmer who had the farm went off and looked for diamonds somewhere and as the story is told, died of a heart attack in a stream trying to find a, a diamond. So the moral of the story is every, every opportunity you have is a great opportunity. It's what you make of it. And if you, you can look at an HR position and say, well, you know, that's benefits and compensation and making sure people get here on time. And I had an opportunity in HR and I was like, okay, it's also about recruiting the best people. So we're gonna build a really good recruiting program. We'll spend a lot of time on major campuses around the United States. Number two is developing people. We're gonna develop a training program so that we can make these people very successful and then retaining them. And so we're gonna make this a better culture. So we're gonna do things to refine this culture. So people wanna stay here and there's a sense of loyalty. So my job as an HR person was not boring. I was, I had energy every day because there's so much variety to it. So I think it's what you make of it. And just keep in mind too, John, that while you're looking at somebody else's past, you're thinking, boy, Christine really hasn't made, I wish I had, I wish I had her job. Somebody's looking at your past, you're thinking, I wish I was in his pasture. I'd make, really make something of it. So every job out there is a great opportunity. It's just what you put into it. That's fantastic, Bill. Any uh, other questions from folks on the line? It's, it's coming up on eight o'clock, so I've pushed an evaluation form out to everyone in the chat window. We would love to hear your feedback on what you thought of tonight's talk, but we've probably got time for one more question if there is one. Nope. 
Okay. All right. Well, Bill, I, I know I say this every Wednesday night at eight o'clock. This has been fantastic. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Hopefully everybody got something out of it. Absolutely. Thanks for, being, thanks for letting me be involved. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for participating tonight. And um, we'll have our final session next week. Bill, do you want to give a teaser on next week's topic just real quick? Next week's topic is uh, leading others through connecting with them. I, one of the lessons I learned when I was in business is that the servant leadership concept is really comes to fruition when you get to a certain point in your career and you feel like, well, I've, I've really achieved a lot of good things. Now it's your turn to start helping other people become successful. So it'll be about that. That's going to be fantastic. And that will and that'll conclude our series. So we will look for everyone to join us next Wednesday night and um, have a great rest of the night, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Christine.